Y'all ready for the Word of God? I probably will not be very long-winded tonight. You know what that means. I want to show you a kingdom principle tonight uh, about how we should approach the different projects and endeavors and uh, the things that God wants us to accomplish in life. Because how many know that God wants you to accomplish things? Our, our, our purpose as a Christian is not just to get saved and then wait around for heaven. Our, church, our, our, our purpose uh, as a church and as individuals is when you get born again, you've got a purpose. You've, you've, got, you've got callings and giftings and things that God wants you to do. But how many know that sometimes when you set out to accomplish something, uh, sometimes there's roadblocks. Sometimes there's things that interfere with uh, that thing producing the way that it ought to produce. Amen? So we're going to talk a little bit about how we should approach these things, especially when something that you know God has called you to do or something that you're engaged in just isn't producing the way that it ought to produce according to the word of God. There are many people who will start a project, start a business, start a relationship, start anything with all sorts of energy and enthusiasm. But then somewhere down the road, they get discouraged for one reason or another. And they, and they feel like quitting. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. The rest of y'all are lying. But Jesus showed, something, showed us something very powerful in one of his parables. The title of tonight's message is, Let Me Dig Around It. Let me dig around it. So let's dig right into this, okay? Luke chapter 16, we're going to look at one of Jesus' parables. Verse 6, then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on the fig tree, but he didn't find any. Now, how many know that that's a problem? Fig trees are supposed to produce figs. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? So let's stop here for a minute. Why should I keep a fig tree that keeps sucking up the nutrients of the soil and it's not producing anything? I, I'm, a, I'm a vineyard owner. I have other trees in the vineyard who are profitable for me. I have other trees that are producing figs. This one's not producing any figs. So the trees that are producing figs, they could be benefiting from the soil that this tree is sucking up all the nutrients out of it. Those other trees that are producing, they would produce even more if we got rid of this tree. By the way, since we're talking about this, did you know that the Bible tells us that you should have seven or eight streams of income? How many knew that? How many had never heard that before? A lot of people haven't. The Bible says you should have seven or eight streams of income. Do you know why? It's because if one or two or three of those streams of income aren't producing, then the other ones will pick up the slack for it. So I want to show that to you real quick, just so you know I'm not preaching heresy. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 2, it says, Invest in seven ventures, yes, in eight You do not know what disaster may come upon the land. I picture Solomon writing this, and he goes, invest in seven uh, seven ventures. No, eight. (laughs) I kind of picture like he changed his mind right after he wrote it. Invest in seven ventures, even eight of them, because you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. You don't know what thing in the future might affect one of the ventures that you're invested in, but you've got other ventures to keep you afloat. It's another way of saying don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Because look, if all of your eggs are in one basket and that basket breaks, you've lost all your eggs. 
I don't have time to tell the story, but whenever I see this verse, it always reminds me of the story of a little town in Ohio that all of the eggs of this town were in one basket. It was in a factory. There was a factory that employed almost everybody in the town. And that factory had all of its eggs in one basket because they only made one product for one manufacturer that they were producing this product for. And then when the manufacturer canceled their, their contract, the entire town was out of work because everybody had all their eggs in one basket. It's amazing to me how many successful people live under biblical principles, even if they're not a believer, and most of the time they don't even know that the principles that made them successful come from the Bible. There are many financial books and financial strategies out there that tell you that the optimal amount of income streams is seven. A lot of secular publications will say that. Having seven income streams gives a good amount of diversification without being too much to handle. Because if you had 24 streams of income, that would be too big of a load for you to handle. And, and like I say, I've read this in, in secular publications. They just don't know that it's biblical. So this vineyard owner, he had multiple sources of income in his vineyard because he had multiple trees. He had multiple fig trees. But this one wasn't producing. And in fact, let's go back to verse 7. It says that it hadn't produced for three years. This tree hasn't produced for three years. Folks, if you work on something for three years and it's not producing, don't you think you would be tempted to cut it down? If you started a business and it wasn't profitable after three years, if you were in a dysfunctional relationship for three years, if you're trying to build something, trying to build a, a, a business or a project or, or whatever, and after three years it's still not working, you'd be tempted to cut it down. And the owner is saying, not only is this tree not producing, it's also hindering my other trees from producing more because it's stealing their nutrients out of the soil. You need to cut this thing down. And so here's what the vineyard keeper said, the gardener. Next verse, verse eight. Sir, the man replied, Leave the tree alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. And that's why I titled the message tonight, Let Me Dig Around It. Let me dig around this tree and fertilize it. Let's see if we can get this thing to produce. The owner said, that's it. Enough is enough. I'm finished with this thing. I'm finished with this tree. Cut the tree down. It's worthless to me because it's not producing. And it should be. And the owner has a point. Right? There's only one reason to have a vineyard of fig trees. And that is to produce, harvest, and sell figs. That's the point. If you can't produce figs, then you can't harvest figs. And if you can't harvest figs, then you can't sell figs. The main goal here for this vineyard owner is the profit from selling figs. The vineyard owner is not doing this as a hobby. This is his business. This is his livelihood. He's doing this to make a profit. Profit is a good word, by the way. Sometimes we've turned profit into a bad word in the body of Christ. Profit's a good word. This tree is not profitable. Cut it down. But the vineyard keeper, the gardener, some translations of the Bible call him the gardener, the vineyard keeper said, wait a minute, let's not cut this down, cut the tree down just yet. Let's not be too hasty here. Are you sure that you've done everything you can do to make this tree produce? Now, when I was reading this, part of me wants to say, why did it take you three years to address this issue? The, the vineyard owner, he said, this tree has not produced for me for three years. Well, why did it take three years for you to get to the place where you want to cut this thing down? 
After the first year, didn't it catch your attention? This tree didn't produce anything this year. It should have. Why didn't it? Well, he didn't do anything about it. And then the second year, it still didn't produce anything. He didn't do anything about it. And then the third year, it didn't produce anything. And he said, cut this thing down. Why did you wait so long to address it? Louise and I, we had some friends. We still have some friends. Um, <clears throat> we had some friends in Alabama who were going through a divorce. And all of us were completely flabbergasted when they went through the, through the divorce because the wife just said one day, she goes, that's it, I'm done, I want a divorce, I want out. And the problem was they had underlying issues in their marriage and they had these issues for years and they hadn't done anything to address their marital issues until the marriage was so far gone that they didn't think that the marriage was salvageable. And so when I saw that happen, I just wanted to say, why did you wait so long? Why did you wait so long to address this? Why did you, and, and in the same way with this parable, vineyard owner, why did you wait three years to do something about this tree? I taught this a couple of years ago. When it comes to flying, if you're off course, the longer you wait to correct your course, the bigger the course correction has to be. But if you find yourself off course and you adjust course immediately, all you gotta make is a small correction and just keep on going. The earlier the course correction, the smaller the correction is. Don't, don't put stuff off. If there's, if there's a problem, fix it. Amen? But regardless of how long it took, to address this situation, the vineyard keeper tells the owner, he says, we might be able to give this particular tree some extra attention. We might be able to get this tree to produce to its full potential. Let me dig around it. Let me fertilize it. In other words, there's still hope. And folks, I want to tell you tonight, there's still hope for your dream to come true. There's still hope for your business to flourish, your project, your endeavor. There's still hope for your relationship. There's still hope for your healing. There's still hope for the thing that God called you to do. Why y'all so quiet? There's still hope. Here we go. But it's going to require you doing something that you've never done before. A few weeks ago, Louise was praying, and she was praying about our church. And she came to me after she was done praying and she said, God spoke to me during this prayer, but she was praying about our church. She was praying about our church growth. She was praying about our future. She was praying about our building. She was praying about how Faith Life Worship Center is gonna fulfill its potential. And God spoke to Louise, this was a few weeks ago, and he said these words. He said, in order for you to get something you've never had before, you're going to have to do something you've never done before. Now, she didn't know what that meant specifically, but she did share that with me. She said, God told me in order for us to get something we've never had, we're going to do something that we've never done. The vineyard keeper in this parable had never dug around the tree and fertilized it before. You know how we know this? Because if he had, then he wouldn't be theorizing that this is the answer. This is the solution. Let's give this a try. Otherwise, he would have said, well, I already tried that and it didn't work. He had never dug around this tree before. He'd never fertilized it before. Folks, if you're not prepared to do something or try something that you've never done or never tried before, you don't really want success. If you want success, you're willing, you're willing to put aside any excuse that's gonna hinder you from your, from your success. You're willing to do anything, amen? A few weeks ago, we looked at the parable of the talents. And we saw in that parable, and most of us are familiar with it, the master went on a journey, and he had three servants who were working for him, and he gave one servant five talents, he gave the other servant two talents, and he gave the third uh, servant one talent. 
And the guy that was given five turned his into ten. The guy who was given two turned his into four. But the last guy that was given one, he buried his talent and he produced no increase. I'm going to say it this way. He put forth zero effort. He just buried it. In fact, in the original language, it says that he, he wrapped it in a cloth and he buried it. That word cloth is burial cloth, grave clothes. He had a funeral service for what the master had given him. He considered what the master had given him to be dead. And so he had a, he had a funeral service for it and he buried it. But one of the key principles that we saw in that parable is that the master did not tell the servants what to do with their talents. Now, remember, the word talent, it's actually a measure of money. But it also applies to your talent. It applies to anything that God gives you and, and makes you responsible for. One uh, version of the Bible says that it doesn't use the word talents. It says he gave one man five bags of silver. He gave another man two bags of silver. Give another man one bag of silver. But the point that I want to make is when he went on his journey, he did not tell the servants what to do with it. He just said, I'm going on a journey and I'm going to be returning. It was up to them to make the most out of what God had given them. And that's the same way with us. And that's exactly what God spoke to me at the beginning of my career when I was in Bible college. I was trying to figure out, Lord, where do you want me to go and, and where, where do you want me to start my ministry? Where should I be sending my resume to? Who should I be calling? Who should I be contacting? Should I go on the road? Should I work for a church? What, what do you want me to do? And one day God spoke to me and he said, Heath, it's up to you to find a way to make the biggest impact for the kingdom with what I've given you. God wants you to put your talent to work. He wants you to put your giftings to work. He wants you, because if he simply told you and, and handheld you through every single step of the way and you did that, that doesn't mean as much as if you do something out of your own heart and give it to him. Amen? As a pastor, I have the responsibility of making the biggest impact that I can make for the kingdom of God. Actually, as a Christian, we all have the responsibility of making the biggest impact that we can make for the kingdom of God. As a pastor, I have the responsibility of making Faith Life Worship Center make the biggest impact that it can make. I have the responsibility of bringing in increase, just like the servants in the parable of the talents. I have the responsibility of reaching more souls tomorrow than I reach today. I can't camp out on yesterday's achievements and be satisfied with that. We serve a God of increase and we live in a kingdom of increase. Amen? We can't rest on our laurels. There's always a, there's always a deeper place to go. Always another step, always a next level. And along the way, along our journey, there are going to be opportunities that will present themselves. And some of these opportunities are going to be the right opportunity and some of them will not. Some of these opportunities are going to be things that it's, it's a door you shouldn't go through. But some of them are going to be the right opportunity. And as a pastor, some of these opportunities are right for me and for this ministry. Some are not. Only a few months after we started this church, the church that we were renting from, they proposed a merger of our two churches. And our church, we were only three or four months old at that time. And they wanted us to merge our two churches and they wanted me to pastor the whole thing. And at first I was very intrigued by this opportunity. Their pastor, he wanted to retire and here I was, a brand new pastor. I wanted to reach souls for Christ and teach people how the kingdom worked. 
And so at first, what they proposed, they said, let's merge our youth groups together first. Let's just merge the two youth groups and we'll see how this works on a small scale first. And if it works with the youth groups, then we can look at merging the two churches together. Well, merging the two youth groups together ended up being a bit of a train wreck. How many remember it? <laughs> because there were people from that other church who were not on board with the idea of what we were trying to do, and they kept interfering with what we were trying to accomplish. But here's the thing, they didn't answer to me. They didn't go to my church, they went to the other church. So they answered to him, and they were undermining the whole thing, and he refused to correct them for it. And in the meantime, the youth were all sorts of confused because they didn't know who to follow. Because people who were not leaders kept asserting themselves into leadership positions. <laughs> and so while all of this was going on with the youth group, we were continuing to have talks with the church leadership about doing a merger of the two churches. And we noticed that the longer time passed, the more red flags we saw. There was a lot of dysfunction in the church body. Not ours, but, well, let's face it, there's dysfunction in our body too. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. But there was a lot of dysfunction in their church body. There was a lot of dysfunction in their leadership. There was a lot of misrepresentation of things, uh, especially finances. They told us, you know, the church income was a certain number, but then we looked into their finances and we discovered that the real number was much less than what we were told. And there were also some major integrity issues going on with their leadership. We caught several of their leaders in some really bold lies. I'm not talking about exaggerations, I'm talking just totally made up stuff. Just total lies. And so we eventually decided this merger was not for us. But, and this is important, we couldn't know that it wasn't right until we actually investigated the possibility. We had to dig around the tree. We had to see if there was a way to make that tree produce. And if not, cut it down. But here's the thing, I would rather dig around the tree and try to make the tree produce than to not give it a try at all and just cut the thing down and always wonder what if. Right? Now, I wanna show you something else about this parable. Let's go back to verse eight and nine and I'm gonna show it to you in the English Standard Version. And uh, there's a phrase here that was not in the other version that we read a moment ago. Verse eight and nine, it says, and this is the vineyard keeper talking to the vineyard owner. It says, and he answered him, sir, let this tree alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, read those next words. So if the tree bears fruit, that's good. But if not, you cut it down. The vineyard keeper is telling the vineyard owner he can cut the tree down. Some translations call the vineyard keeper the gardener. The gardener is telling the owner to cut the tree down. Doesn't that sound strange to you? The gardener is telling the owner to cut the tree down? Don't you think that would normally be the gardener's job? Wouldn't he be the one to cut the tree down? The gardener works with these trees every day. He trims them. He prunes them. He digs around them. He fertilizes them. He's responsible for their care. He does this for a living. This is his job. And yet he tells the owner to cut the tree down. Why? Because ultimately, it's not the gardener's responsibility to decide which investments stay and which ones go. Because he's not the owner. It's not his responsibility to cut down something that's not working. That's the owner's call. The gardener won't have to answer for it if it's a mistake. It's the owner's tree to either cut down or save. 
and the owner will have to answer for his own decision. That's the privilege and the burden of being the owner, being the one in charge. The privilege is that if you're the one in charge, you get to reap the benefits of the decisions that you make. But the burden is you also suffer the consequences of the bad decisions that you make. So a few years ago, when we were deciding whether or not to merge with this other church, we had to cut down the tree. We tried digging around it. We tried fertilizing it. We tried seeing if this would work. We had to dig around the tree. But ultimately, I was the one who had to make the decision. I was the one who had to explore all the possibilities. I was the one who had to have the conversations. I was the one who had to ask all the hard questions. And I had to do all this while I was pastoring my own church, casting vision, managing projects, managing outreaches, and doing all the other responsibilities that I had. In other words, what I'm saying is, when it came to doing this merger, I couldn't delegate that to somebody else. It was my call. And there were months of conversations that were involved. And I think one of the reasons that there were months involved is that God just wasn't in it. Most of the time, folks, when God is in something, the process is not stretched out over a really long, long period of time. It's not drug out. When God's in it, things just fall into place. You know, when we first started this church, from the time that Pastor Grant called me into his office and gave me a deadline to start my church, from that day to the time that we had our first church service was seven weeks. In just seven weeks, God provided a building for us. He provided the manpower that we needed. He provided the resources and everything that we needed in order to start a church. It came quick because God was in it. When I first came to Naples, back in 2012, I was only supposed to be here for two weeks. I came down here for two weeks to help out New Hope Ministries, uh, lead worship for them for a couple of weeks while they were searching for their next worship leader. And God quickly showed me that this was where we were supposed to, to be for that season. We put our house up for sale, it sold quickly. We found a house here in Naples, we bought it quickly. Everything fell into place in very short order. And not only that, our house was exactly what we needed. It was the, it was the perfect fit for our family. It was the perfect location because it was right across the street from my job. It was everything that we were looking for and the house was a steal <laughs> because it had been a foreclosure. Jesus told us that the yoke is easy and the burden is light. Remember when he said that? He said, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, you'll find rest for your souls. He says, take my yoke upon you because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you're taking notes, write this down. If the yoke is difficult and the burden is heavy, God isn't in it. It's that simple. I want to tell you something funny about this. When I was putting this message together, and, I, and God dropped that in my spirit, if the yoke is difficult and the burden is heavy, I wrote this down in my notes. I wrote, if the yoke is difficult and the burden is heavy, God probably isn't in it. And the Holy Spirit stopped me and he goes, why do you have the word probably in there? There's no probably about it. If the yoke is difficult and the burden is heavy, I'm not in it. There's no probable about it. He, he told me, he said, remove that word. So, yes, Lord, I, I removed it. <laughs> now, most of you in this room tonight know why I've been talking about all this. I told everybody who was here on Tuesday that there's a local church here in Naples that has proposed that we merge with them and that I pastor the two churches merged together. Now, when I announced this on Tuesday, there were several people who were very excited about it, and there were also some people who had some reservations about it. And to be honest with you, I have some of the same reservations. 
because this is something we've never done before. And there's a lot of questions that need to be asked and a lot of answers that, that, that we need to have in order to make this decision. And without going into all of the detail that I went into on Tuesday night, I want to simply explain for those who weren't here on Tuesday, I have seen this coming for several months. I felt strongly in my spirit that this particular church was going to propose this to me. I didn't speak to them about it. They didn't speak to me about it. I think the Holy Spirit was just preparing me that this was coming. And then about three or four weeks ago, one of our church members came up to me and told me that she had had a dream that this particular church was going to ask if we merge with them. And when she told me that, uh, I was kind of flabbergasted because I, I had not said anything to anybody about this. It, it had just been kind of rumbling in me for the last couple of months. And then while all of this was going on, the church that we're renting from, Oasis Church, just had a couple of huge financial shots in the arm. I think you guys noticed that they're uh, repaving the parking lot as a result of those financial shots in the arm. So they're not financially dependent on our rent anymore. And then two weeks ago, Louise was praying and God said to her, in order to get something you've never had, you're going to have to do something that you've never done. And Louise even said a few times over the past couple of months, I remember Louise, she's probably said this three or four times, you know, I wonder if a church is going to ask us to merge with them. And I said nothing when she said this. I just remained quietly observant of everything that was going on. And then last week, a pastor friend of mine from Fort Myers came down here to meet with me and I wanted to show him the building because he'd never been here before and he's going to be preaching here in a couple of weeks. I wanted to show him the facility and we drove over here. I got out of my car, he got out of his car and as we're walking across the parking lot, he stops me, puts his hand on my shoulder and he says, Pastor Heath, you're not supposed to be here. I mean, spoke that prophetically. He says, I, that something doesn't feel right. You're, you're not supposed to be here. You're, you're not supposed to be on this property. And then it was 15 minutes later that this other pastor called me and he said, Pastor Heath, I want you to pray about us merging our two churches together. So all of these things have come together in very short order. And the timing has led me to believe that this might be something that God wants us to do. But having said all of that, I want to make something 100% clear tonight. Nothing is set in stone yet. We are merely at the beginning of a conversation. Something has been proposed, and that's all. Like I said, there are many unanswered questions. There are still many conversations that need to continue to happen. There's a lot of logistical things that need to be discussed. I will say this. I do not believe that there are theological things that need to be discussed. Because I am familiar enough with their ministry and they are familiar enough with ours that I do believe theologically we are on the same page. The pastor himself told me, he said, Pastor Heath, he says, I've met every spirit-filled pastor in Naples. He said, nobody sees eye to eye with me theologically the way you do. Nobody preaches faith like you and I do. Nobody preaches kingdom like you and I do. But I needed to communicate all these things with you tonight because I didn't want this thing to blindside you when it came, when it came time for us to take the next step, whatever that step may be. We're all family here at Faith Life. And you deserve to be in the loop because you're family. And I'm gonna say this, if this is actually God's plan for us, everything is gonna fall into place in probably very short order because that's just how God works. That's the way it's always worked. And the, if this is not God's plan for us, we'll know. But ultimately, as the pastor, it's going to be my call, and I'll have to answer for that, good or bad. Here's what I'm asking of you tonight. Will you let me dig around it? That's all we're going to do. We're going to dig around it. 
And if it produces, fine. And if not, we'll cut it down. It won't be the first time that we've had to cut it down. But I also want to tell you tonight, when it comes to your own endeavors, your own businesses, your own relationships, your own marriages, the other things that God has called you to accomplish, the other things that you're believing God for, don't give up until you've dug around it. Until you've done everything you can to make that thing produce the way God's word says it's supposed to produce. Amen? Don't cut it down. Dig around it. Fertilize it. Make sure that you've done everything that you can do. And then if not, then that's the time to cut it down. Can you say amen to that tonight? That's all I have for you. Hi, I'm Heath. And I'm Louise. Thanks so much for watching. Please do us a favor and remember to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Also, comment below. Connect with us and let us know if there's anything we can pray about. If you enjoyed this video, we believe you'll enjoy it even more to visit us in person at Faith Life Worship Center in Naples, Florida. You can find Faith Life Worship Center on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or through our website, faithlifenaples.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.